but we're going to be talking about in the pit. And he said, well, that's a really nice uh, title there. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but uh, in the pits, hey, when, when you think of in the pits, do you think of something positive or negative? Now, when Michelle hears it, she thinks like mud pit. She thinks, yes, woo! <laughs> and in fact, the reason why I invited the parents to, teens, uh, to the teen snack tonight was because I had gotten an idea from the Taylorville High School. They said, uh, they said that they got a bunch of mattresses and they put the moms on top of them and they carried them. Well, I was thinking, well, we could put the moms on top and dump them in the mud pit, and it would just be an awesome night, wouldn't it? Josh is excited. That's why he came tonight. I mean, it's just, it's going to be great. And so, and, and then the moms that are not here, they're thankful that they didn't come tonight. No, we're not going to do that tonight, I promise. Don't, don't run, okay? But you think of in the pits, um, you think, man, that's, that's going to be pretty negative. Well, yeah, how do you respond to the negative things in life? You brush them off. We'd like to, right? You know, how do you, how do you respond? Because any preacher that'll get up to you and say that, that the Christian life is just going to be at a bed of roses, they're a liar, okay? And, and, and they should just be ushered right off the stage because we know that Jesus teaches a totally different thing. You know, you might not even have a, a rock to have as a pillow, you know? He just, he related those things you might not know um, where your next uh, meal's coming from, and for some, for some Christians, that is the case. Um, but then for others, as, as you see, the God followers that that even in Joseph, and when he had made a decision to do what was right, he still had some struggles. He still had some struggles. I got a little story for you, and I have no idea where I got it from. I got it a long time ago, and, and so don't think that this is original from me. But um, just, just listen to this. A husband and wife were having some hard times. The husband walked out to his vehicle and tried to start it, but it wouldn't for the life of him start. That's kind of like on Wednesday night. On Wednesday night, I walked out to my moped. And some bright, young, strapping individual decided to hit my kill switch. Now, if, I don't know if you were out much later on Wednesday night, but it started to rain. Now, rain and moped doesn't quite go together. But, uh, but I was trying to start my moped. And I was like, what is going on? It started beforehand. What is going on? It was really just upsetting. And then I got almost out of town and it started raining on me. So I got a nice shower that night. But just think, you know, put yourself in these people's shoes. You go out, you try to start the vehicle and it doesn't start. And, and, and they popped the hood, found their battery was missing with the note in place saying, I needed your battery so I could get to the hospital. Okay, that's interesting. The next day, the battery was back with Dallas Cowboys tickets. Not sure that that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> but the battery was back. Praise the Lord, right? Okay. They love the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, man, they are having some struggles. But anyway, when the game came, they went, came back home, and found their house cleaned out. It was a setup. Oh, man, that would be so depressing, wouldn't it? Talk about, you know, that, that small valley. And then, oh, man, I get to go to a game. You provide it? Hey, cool. And, th and then we might even mention, oh, man, God provided these football tickets. And then while we come back, all of a sudden we open up our house and it's cleaned out. Whoo. Total nosedive. Now, were you still thinking that God provided those football tickets for you? But then you got to ask yourself, okay, is God in control? Is God actually sovereign? That's what we got to ask ourselves. And do we believe it? Because God says that he is. Uh, it says in Colossians that, that our entire existence, the, the universe, is sustained by the power of Jesus Christ. So the moment that Jesus Christ pulls back his power 
everything goes into absolute chaos. I mean, what is holding our bodies together right now? Some of you are saying, well, not much. I'm feeling it, okay? But I mean, in all honesty, you might still be at least walking around. It might be using a walker, but we, we might be walking around. It's like, wow, God is still holding it together. Um, God is still uh, making sure that gravity is sustained. God is powerful. But the moment that he took away that power, all of a sudden, what happens? Absolute chaos. And that's what it says in God's word. But do we as Christians believe it? When we get that little low valley, then all of a sudden we get a little high, and then bam, we get hit with a nosedive. I'm finally making some headway here, and bam. And that's exactly where Joseph was in the midst of being sold into slavery. He goes in and is handed everything over to him uh, in Potiphar's house. I mean, he is stewarding everything. Potiphar, the only thing that he knows about is the fact of the bread that's being put on his plate and he's going to eat it. The food that's being going into his stomach. That's the only thing that he's actually caring about because he has placed everything in Joseph's hands and everything is just going great. And then all of a sudden the option comes into play and Joseph decides not to take it. He decides to glorify God and to choose God and to choose his responsibility over choosing his selfishness. And he still gets in trouble. Have you ever dealt with that? You did what's right, but then you still got hit with something? And so we know that he got put into jail, and then all of a sudden we understand that he, he decides to accept his circumstances there. And everyone that was within the jail, all of the jailkeeper's job was placed into Joseph's hand because he trusted them. See, wow, all over again, Joseph is just choosing to accept his circumstances. He's choosing to operate within his own. But once you operate in your zone, what happens when it goes in the pits? Are you willing to take some of these principles here tonight that we're going to see and to actually apply them? So let's jump into the first point, ministry in the pits. Say ministry in the pits. What are you talking about? Let's get to it. Verse number one. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Okay, so we've got the butler and the baker. They offended the king. Guess what happens? Okay, and Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. So in the same place that Joseph is being put into stewardship over. He's actually becoming the top guy within the jail. These two guys are, are, are joining him. In verse 4, it says, And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in ward. So here he is. He's in charge of everything, and yet this guy comes in, the one that's over him, and says, Joseph, you're going to serve these two new prisoners. You're going to serve them. And that's where we hear those dreaded words, that's not my job. Not here, though. Verse 5. And, and they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them, tell me them, I pray you. So we come into this interesting situation where 
the, the baker and the butler, they've offended the, the Pharaoh, and, and they've been thrown into the same prison, and yet Joseph has been given um, to charge over them and, and needs to serve them. And, and as he comes in the morning, he doesn't pass off this, um, this responsibility. He comes in and he notices that they are distraught. They are sad. And instead of passing it up, instead of saying, get over it, he jumps in and he says, hey, listen, what's up? What's wrong? What's happening? And they've had a, a couple of rough dreams, both of them, and they're, they're, you know, like how we get, you know, when your wife wakes up and she's mad at you, and you say, what did I do in your dream? Yeah, that, yeah, you know what you did in my dream. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, okay? So it's, it's affecting them. And have you ever had a dream that's just been so emotional for you? It's intense. Sometimes you wake up more tired than you were when you went to bed. Have you ever been there before? And yet both of them are having such an impactful dream, and yet he's willing to step in and to actually understand what's going on with them and to ask them, hey, what's up? And, and he says, hey, listen, these, they, we've had these dreams. And he says, listen, isn't this God's job? to know what's going on here? Isn't this, isn't this, uh, isn't this a moment where he's, he's coming back and he's pointing these guys in their distress back to God? Have you ever noticed that? Look back at that verse, number eight, and they said to them, we have dreamed a dream and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Don't we find the truth in God? Isn't the, he the source of what we need in this moment? And so, so even though Joseph is where he is, he decides to step in and to serve those who come into this jail. He decides to serve those despite being in the pits, he, he decided to care for those despite being in the pits. He decided to see what their needs were, and he decided to, to point these guys who were in their struggles right back to God and helping them understand where the answers can actually come from. And you know what? We struggle with this, don't we? Don't we struggle with this? Has anybody, has anybody been distraught before you? Has anybody been a little bit emotional in front of you? And you say, hey, what's up? What's going on? They say, well, do we even go there? Do we even ask the questions? Because you see somebody upset, some of us say, drama, uh-uh, no way, I am out. Dads, you ever do that? When I mean, isn't it Daughter Day or something like that? National Daughter Day? I think I heard that. I see stuff on Facebook. And I didn't give in to the peer pressure yet, so we're doing good so far. But dads, when, you're, when your daughter's crying in the room, do you run? Yes. No, you don't. You ask questions, and then we listen, which is so hard for us. But so many times we think, hey, man, we're already in our situation. We've already had a rough day. I don't have time for this. I don't have the emotional... Uh, 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 resources to be able to help them in their situation, I am out. But instead, he stopped, he asked, he listened, and then he pointed them right straight back to the one who can help them. God. Right straight back to the one who's got the answers, God. You say, well, wait a minute, where's all the answers? I think most of you brought it here tonight. It's the word of God. Do you know how many times do we wait when we're in distress, we wait for the, the banner in the sky 
to know exactly what we're supposed to do next. And that's the only thing that's going to lift our spirits or, or, or just something miraculous showing up to us whenever his word is right in front of us and we've got at least 17 of them hanging out on the shelves in our home. So well, I didn't bring it along with me today, and yet we have these in our pockets. Unless you went exactly right after the service, you went out and took pastor's advice and went and got your flip phone, okay? I'm not sure if you can get your Bible on your flip phone. You might probably can nowadays, but, but how many of us have these devices where we can go and right away access the Word of God, and yet it just sits there? And in fact, your phones start, um, when you don't use a certain app uh, for an extended period of time, does it set it to where you have to download that app again? Do you have it set on your phone? Does that happen to your Bible? Where you've left it alone for that long that you have to re-download it in order to access it again? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But the point is here, it's like you don't even know how to access it because you've left it there on the shelf for so long It's like, where do I go? It's so big. Here, let me close my eyes, open it up, and just take my finger and point to some word. I'm not sure that that's going to help you out much. But we can just start reading. We can start with the Psalms. And you can go back to uh, what Pastor was saying today. He, he, he told us that if we want to do a study, we should do a study on the Psalms and how many times it states that we need to remember what God's done. Man, when you're in the pits, isn't that the best thing for you to be able to do is remember what God has done in the past to show you what he can do in the future? And so in this moment, again, Joseph steps out when he had every excuse that we use. Every excuse that we use. He decides to lay those all aside. By the way, that's another thing that I told the guys at the men's retreat. I said, you want to encourage your pastors? Stop using excuses. We've heard them all. They're boring. <laughs> We've heard them all. Just lay them aside. And do what God's called you to do. Get rid of all the excuses. Stop playing the victim card. And choose victory. See the ministry that's right in front of us and the point where God has allowed him to serve and to bring these people who need God back to God. That's exactly what we need. How many how many teenagers are over in the high school? A couple hundred teenagers, right? Several hundred teenagers in the junior high. There's a lot of kids over there, isn't there? How many problems do you think are over there in the high school and then the junior high? How many problems? Okay. And some of your eyes are getting really big because you're starting to think. All right. How many, how many problems are over in the high school teenagers? Okay. How many problems are there? You know how we fix it? We buy another student resource officer. We get better curriculum. Although our teachers would probably like this. We pay our teachers more and and it'll fix all their problems. We give free lunches, free breakfasts, free suppers, free computers, free all these things, right? And then it'll fix all the problems that we have within our, our school system. You know where I'm going with this, right? Has it worked yet? Because we tried it. It's being done right now. Has it worked yet? Has it fixed all the problems yet? So what's going to fix the problems? 
taking the Word of God to these students and showing them the love of God. And yes, you're struggling. Yes, you're distraught. Yes, there's things happening in your life, and some of these conversations might be a little bit uncomfortable, but here it is. Here's the Word of God. It can help you. It's going to their parents, and instead of criticizing them, just going to them and showing them the love of God. Here's, here's, all, here's all of what God has laid out in Scripture and help you parent. And, and when you look at your child and just say, oh man, this is scary. Listen, God's got your back and let's go to him and have him help us how to parent and how to love our kids and how to overcome ourselves and how all, I mean, all of these things. This is our job. And even when things are in the pits, we still need to see the need and we need to care enough about the need to stop and to listen, to ask questions and to present them back to the truth because they need the truth. What about folks in our church? Have you ever seen somebody distraught in our church? Sometimes we can hide it really well, can't we? But then you start, start peering and say, wait a minute, something's wrong. Something's, something's different about that individual. And you know what's easy is to say, well, I've got to get over to Spring Garden before all the Methodists get over there. So let's get out of here as fast as possible. I don't have time for that drama. And yet, what has God called us to do here? What are, the, what are the principles here? In that situation, it's to see that there is a need and start asking questions and, and to actually listen. Actually listen to what's happening to care enough and point them back to the truth because God's enough. What's the thing that fixed Job? Do you remember? I know we've slept since then. What is the thing that fixed Job? Was it his three friends that showed up? It was a conversation that he had with God when finally after chapter after chapter after chapter of nothing from God, God comes and talks to him and he answers none of his questions. None of them. You know what he did? God talked about how big and how awesome and how great he is and how Job has no idea all the things that's going on. He just needs to understand that God is big and he's big enough to handle all of the situations that's going on. And you know how Job responded? Absolute humility and repentance. That's what we need. That's what people need. And even when we are in the pits, we still have that opportunity because when we are in the pits, then we can actually understand that people are struggling because we're there too. And say, God, God, you can be the answer for this person. You can help them in their addiction. You can help them in their fears. You can help them in their anxiety. You can help them in all these other areas because God's, God's word is, is, is everything that pertains to life and to godliness. That's exactly what he promises. And so we got to go to it. But you know, that's not where he, he stops. He doesn't stop there. He, he finds courage in the pits. Say, courage? What happens? Verse 9, it says, And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler." He's, this is a dream that's, that's, that's interpreted in a very positive manner where in three days, this guy is going to be restored to his position. Everything is going to be as it was. This is great. This is awesome. And you know what? Tell somebody good news. It's easy. 
We love excitement. We love freedom. Just like this. It, it's, it's great to be able to do that. But then he moves on. He says in verse 14, But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. And he shares his story. He says, For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve it. And so I'm just asking for a little bit of kindness. Just like I've shown you kindness, I'm just asking for a little bit of that back just to tell them what's going on and how I don't deserve to be here. And so I'm just, I'm just asking you. I mean, that's, a, that's okay. That's an okay ask there. When we're in the pits, it's okay to desire to be out of the pits. It's okay, to be, it's, it's okay to desire to be on dry ground when you're drowning. It's okay. And sometimes we need to go to someone else that's in, 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 equipped to be able to help us to get where we are on dry ground and, and out of the pits. And that's okay because God creates community. God creates other people to be able to help us when we are down, just as Joseph was helpful for t to this guy. But we go on into verse 16. It says, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he was excited. He said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream. And behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of my basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. Ouch. <laughs> All right. Now, how many of us in that moment <laughs> when it decided, hey, that was a great dream. I think I got some work to do. Okay. All right. I need to go and I need to handle my situation. I've got an entire jail to be able to handle here. Okay. So just let me think about this for the next four days. Okay. And, and, and maybe I'll come back to you after four days. How many of you would have loved to do that? Y'all know what I'm talking about. After four days, his head would be off from him because he would have been hanged on a tree. It's tough to share bad news. And yet Joseph doesn't stop. He doesn't hold back. He just tells them what God's laid out. And that just reminds me of the fact that there's bad news in the Word of God. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, in order to get to the good news, you need to be able to know the bad news. But how many of us struggle to communicate to people that we're all sinners? And that what we all deserve, in fact, it says the wages of sin is what? Death. It's eternal separation from God. And that's tough to tell people because, man, what will they think of me if I tell them all this bad news? I might not be the most liked person. I might not get voted as the most liked person of my class. Or at the, at the workplace, they might, they might shy away from me if I start talking about how we're all deserving of hell. That's pretty rough. And yet, and yet, isn't that a part of God's word where there's times where we need to be able to share the bad news so that we can actually get to the good news? Because how do you need a healer if you don't know that you're sick? How do, you, how do you know that you need a Savior if you don't know that, that you're, you need to be saved?
And in those moments when God allows for these opportunities that are presented right in front of us, we don't, we, we don't pat their back and walk away. We just need to tell them the truth of God's word and then relate to them that God's got a plan and God's got a solution. And, 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 and we, we move on from there. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes there's some bad news. But as you go into the last part of this passage, in the last three verses, we get to hope deferred in the pits. Hope deferred in the pits. We see here in verse 20, and it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker amongst his servants, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. So everything that God had allowed for Joseph to communicate to these guys, it happened exactly as he said it. Verse 23, yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forget him. You know, we can start at the beginning, and we can ask ourselves, how many times when we're struggling, do we actually pay attention? Do we ask questions? Do we listen? Do we care? And point them back to God. How many times that when we have truth, and sometimes it's tough to say, we actually say it? But you know, another question is, how do we respond when we do good things to other people, but they never return the favor? How do we respond? How dare they? I was down and out, and I gave them my last 20 bucks, and they did nothing to come back and, and respond to that. There was, there was no goodwill of them. There was no thanks. And we start complaining. We start getting upset. And then all of a sudden, we hate the person we just helped out. And what good have we really done? Here's something, let me smack you in the face afterwards. I mean, it just, that's, that's kind of the thought process that's moving in that direction. How do we respond when people don't return the favor? Does this ignite anger, hatred, bitterness? Does this stir you away from God or does this help you understand that people are going to continually let you down and that God is good enough that we just need to run right back to him? What does it stir you towards? You know, some, some people walk away from the faith walk away from church because, well, this person in the church did this to me and this person in the church did that to me and this person did this and, and so I'm just, I'm done. I quit. And then you gotta back up and you gotta ask this question. You say, well, so you quit because of what these people did to you, did you actually put your faith in God or did you put your faith in people? Where does your faith line up? Who is your faith in? Is it built on mankind or is it built on God himself, the sustainer of all, the one who's got the plan, the one who's in control? And so that's where we need to back up and we need to start asking those questions. When we respond in, in, in anger towards someone who, who doesn't treat me the way that I think because I did all this for them, then we need to back up and say, listen, Who's going to sustain me? Who's going to give me the satisfaction? It is God himself. It's not humanity. 
You could be the best Christian alive and you're going to still let people down. And so that's where we got to turn around and say, I have to put my faith in God. That's where it has to stay. I have to commit myself to Him. So in all this, are you asking yourself these questions? See, the story with Joseph isn't over yet. If you've read it, you know. Victory's coming. But you also know that if you've been in life long enough, that victory isn't always quick. Has anybody ever experienced that? Sometimes victory takes a while. Sometimes victory takes years. Sometimes victory takes a lifetime. And if we put our faith in people, most likely we're going to wander away. But if we put our faith in God, that's when we can persevere forward. And so when we're in the pits, listen, ask yourselves these questions. How many times when I'm in the pits do I look around and see people? See their needs? Or am I so caught up in myself that I can't see people? I can't see their needs. I can't see how to love them. I can't see how to care and have compassion. How many times when you see people and you start asking questions, do you actually sit there and you listen to them? Because you know what? You know what I have a struggle with? Sitting and listening. My wife will tell you that. Because as a man, I've got a solution to all of her problems. And you know I'm being sarcastic there, right? Okay? But you know, as a man, I, I think that I've got a solution. And man, I've got, I could end this conversation in three seconds and we can get on with our lives. Men, have you ever had that thought process? Okay? All right? I imagine Pastor and I have been tempted quite a few times in counseling sessions just to say, stop it. Good, let's go. Let's go out to eat. Let's have some coffee. I fixed your entire life. Stop. Quit. I mean, just, that's it. Shut your mouth. And yet, is that always the compassion that's needed? Here we find a man that's willing to listen and then point them back to God. Remember what I said earlier? I've got all the solutions to her problems. That's not pointing them back to God. That's not being the right type of husband. It's a matter of helping them see God and all of his goodness and that he's big enough for this issue, but allowing this to grow and to progress and, 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 and to be there. But yet sometimes there is some tough news to give. Sometimes there's some good news to give, but am I courageous enough to give both? And, and, and sometimes when, when I get bit afterwards, am I okay with just being satisfied in God? These are all the questions that we need to be asking ourselves as we walk through life together. How you doing? How's it working out for you? You got it together? Most likely not. So let's pray.